So, um, as I was, uh, we had a, we had a dinner last night, which LJ referenced, and as I was thinking on my way home yeah, about how best to balance both uh, getting Dr. Hill's perspective on all of the things that are happening in the world, and also keeping this discussion to the time limits that we have today, which is a bit of a challenge, um, it occurred to me that maybe the best way to start is to go big and go broad. And there's a lot going on in the world. There is obviously armed conflict in Ukraine, armed conflict in the Middle East. There is possibly imminent conflict in South America and maybe even the Balkans, which we thought we had resolved decades ago. There are daily uh, interactions between Chinese uh, Coast Guard and the Philippine Navy, fishing vessels in Philippine, uh, uh, Philippine territorial waters. There's intensifying geopolitical competition between the United States and its allies in China. There's concern over Taiwan. There's even concern over Japan's territory. Actually, that's not even the full list. So, I would start by asking you, you know, um, you know, first of all, why now? Why are all these things happening now? And secondly, um, are they connected? Is this you know, why, are these disparate events sort of all part of one big trend or mega trends? Or, and finally, I think probably very importantly in this context, what does it mean for America? What are the challenges? What does this mean for U.S. national security? Well, thank you very much, Ms. Um, can everyone hear you okay? Um, the microphone? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here in uh, North Carolina, also in Charlotte. Um, I am just promoting the fact that, yet again, I'm on a very fleeting visit to Charlotte. I, I've been through here so many times, <laughs> through the airport, or I've you been know, to a conference and a convention centre for one night. So I want to make a pledge here and now to, to respond and to <laughs> Charlotte. I'm going to try to come to stay for a few days <laughs> to see the, uh, the city better. Because uh, this is, I think, this is a real um, you know, hub of activity. Um, the World Affairs Councils do amazing work. And you know, one of the reasons I am here is because it's people like you, the World Affairs Council, who make um, such a difference you know, across the United States. Because as you're pointing out here, in it, uh, everything, everything affects uh, the United States and affects business. Last night at dinner, and I'm flipping you know, the, the script here on the question, uh, we have you know, CEOs and representatives, members of uh, the council, uh, from so many multinationals so based here in um, Charlotte, primarily, talking about how uh, all of this affects their bottom line as well. Uh, one major company here that has operations that span the Middle East and into the Asia Pacific uh, on uh, high technology. That means jobs uh, for people um, here in North Carolina when uh, things go wrong geopolitically and you can't get you know, your supplies, uh, your vital supplies, the inputs uh, for your business. If we think back to COVID, which most of us don't want to, but it still has us in its grip one way or another, think about all of the supply disruptions. Uh, and obviously, pandemics uh, can do that, uh, but also wars can. And as Turkey is going through the litany of wars, we're missing out all of the conflicts in Africa. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Latin America, Venezuela making moves on Guyana. All of these are interrelated because there's a perception that the world system has shifted and is going to shift further. And this is again where the United States comes in. You know, for the last 70 years, uh, the world has mostly been under what we might call Pax Americana. And the question is whether this is going to shift to what's kind of awkwardly called Pax Silica. I was thinking, think, is that actually right? You know, in terms of you know, the dominance of China, or perhaps the emergence of two blocks as we've had for such a long time through the Cold War, instead of the Soviet Union, you know, the world divided into two blocks with China playing the role that the Soviet Union was before. But the main point here is the rest of the world doesn't want that. We've spent a lot of time in places like Washington, D.C., talking about the new Cold War with China and the United States and an economic, geopolitical, political standoff. It's been described in various ways, democracy versus autocracy, usually with you know, China in the lens there. I'm sure you've done a lot of you know, work on this yourself, but uh, you mentioned you know, the build-up of, of China as a major military power, not just as an economic power in the Indo-Pacific region. The constant pressure that's been put on the Philippines, but also in Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, uh, and a whole host of other countries where China has made predatory investments, you know, flipping you know, uh, countries' economies towards economic dependency on China because of high debts. We think of Sri Lanka and some of the other uh, conflicts that have emerged there because they're heavily indebted to China. 
But when you start to get beyond all of those headlines, everything we think about Taiwan and what's going to happen in the South and you know, East China seas, you also see a world that has really um, emerged over this last 70 years, which most countries are focused on their own regions. Venezuela is messing about in Guyana because it also doesn't see the United States as a major hegemon in you know, the Western Hemisphere, in, uh, in the Americas, and sees an opportunity here because you know, we don't have um, a Western Hemisphere or a Latin South American policy. We just simply don't. When I was in government, we had a crisis with Venezuela, and it became very clear that we never really thought about how to deal with Latin and uh, South America beyond all of the old style interventions of the 1960s and 1970s, or in terms of dealing with guns, drugs, and thugs in you know, Colombia, or you know, the way that we keep uh, menacing our neighbor to the south in Mexico, and also migration, obviously, critical national security issue on the southern border. But we haven't then thought about how we develop you know, those relationships. And in that absence, others are developing their own sets of relationships. You see Brazil not really kind of wanting to go along with the United States and looking at its relations with China and Russia. When you have the standoff with Venezuela over Maduro's you know, faking of the uh, election, and Juan Guaido, uh, Guaido the um, uh, person who uh, was at the coalition that won the election, uh, you saw the Russians moving in pretty quickly with a hundred specialists to stop the United States from um, intervening. We tried to put a coalition uh, you know, together with the European countries that also have populations in Latin and South America or holding still in the terms of the Dutch and the British and you know, and others in the Caribbean. And everything just fell apart over all the inconsistencies and we found the Mexicans in particular uh, being you know, very obstructionist because of you know, resentments and grievances that have built up in the United States. You can play that out across the world, uh, in Africa, in you know, um, uh, Southeast Asia as well. When we had uh, uh, Duterte in the Philippines, you know, we saw that uh, on, uh, in evidence. There's been a flip, of course, with the uh, recent change in government, as you're alluding uh, to that. But we're actually seeing a world that doesn't want a hegemon, and doesn't want to be split uh, between uh, two uh, big blocks. We're seeing a demand at the United Nations level, not from the United Nations Security Council. People saying, how is it that for 70 years you've still got China, the United States, Britain, France, and Russia on the Security Council? Of course, China, the US, and Russia are always playing off in vetoes, and France and Britain don't look like the best representatives anymore of you know, other voices. But it's because of the five uh, permanent nuclear powers but there's no longer five permanent nuclear powers. We've got India, we've got Pakistan, we've got South Africa, we've got Iran that wants to have uh, nuclear weapons, we've got North Korea that's already broken out. You know, that we're in a much different world. And that's why everything's interconnected. Uh, just to you know, wrap this up, it's because the world has changed dramatically, demographic change, for 8 billion people. When I first came to the United States in 1989, we were at two. No, because it's that exp exponential growth of you know, population, technological change. You know, we're talking about making our 8 billion you know, fellow members of humanity obsolete uh, with artificial intelligence or with you know, more um, you know, technological uh, breakthroughs on so many you know, work fronts. Uh, we've got a massive climate change, uh, so many um, questions about sustainability. We've got famine on them and food issues on top of war. The rest of the world is basically saying, we need a different system, because that's not working for us. Just like domestic people say, things aren't working for us either. That, that, that's good. just a great, uh, a great way to start. And you put out a lot of different issues. I would say that one thing that, that strikes me about at least the last three forces that you mentioned, demographic change, technological change, and climate change, is that they're not felt equally across the world. And so, for example, China's demographics are not strong at all. They're not, it creates challenges, domestic political and economic challenges. So, we can talk a little bit also try and understand how these things are disparate. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, we think about this at home in the United States, as European countries do as well. They're kind of north south equivalent divides of inequality. We've got a lot of immigrants within our cities. I'm sure, you know, I've spent more time here in Charlotte. I'd sort of hear about, you know, uh, from different parts of the city, you know, the uh, acute differences. I see Mary uh, Curtis here from uh, Baltimore, you know, which that's you know, another obvious place where you know, I'm, I'm from the great state of Maryland. And you, know, you see all that inequality, you know, uh, very starkly. I work in uh, Washington, D.C. It's inescapable. You think of the differences between you know, the old Midwest 
places like Flint, Michigan and elsewhere, but in the American heartland, now we think of them as the Rust Belt. But that's a global phenomenon, because as uh, Tate is saying, uh, all of these issues are felt equally in other places. The kinds of north-south divides that we have here that lead to political grievance, that's what we're seeing on a global scale. And if you look at the countries that are most aggrieved in the United States right now, by no major coincidence, they're all countries that did, were not first in line for vaccines during the COVID uh, crisis. We may not want to have vaccines, some of the people in our population, but the rest of the world does. Because one of the major um, uh, reasons for our leap forward and various uh, issues in the past was breakthrough vaccines from things like polio, uh, measles, you know, things that I have relatives who uh, were afflicted by both. Members of my grandparents' family died of uh, infectious disease. They were always lined up, you know, first for vaccinations in the UK and elsewhere. And that's the rest of the world as well. They see um, vaccines not as a political issue, but as a privilege because you know, it helps to put human health on a different level. Malaria, malaria vaccine, you know, for example, right now. And there's deep resentment in the rest of the world that we forgot about them. We thought about whether they're getting vaccinated or not. And we didn't think about, you know, the rest of the world during COVID. We don't think about them during wars. I hear all the time uh, from the leaders of other countries, and I try to talk to them about Ukraine. Where were you in Yemen? Where were you in Sudan? Where are you on Ethiopia? Why do we always care about European wars and now, you know, the Middle East? Why don't we care about, you know, conflicts anywhere else? It's that sort of sense of grievance, the fact that people are feeling things differently and that we are fighting among ourselves and not addressing their issues as well as at the root of this. Well, in, in, you mentioned these conflicts, these armed conflicts. I, you said something last night that I thought was really provocative and interesting and, and important, I think, to, to explore a little bit more here, which is, you know, World War III has started. Now, when we, most Americans, and this has been a problem, a strategic challenge for the U.S. for the last couple of decades, think of the geopolitical system existing in two states. One is peace and the other is war, and they're relatively separate. I think, to your point, and I'd love for you to expand upon this, is there is a continuum of conflict that we want to see, and conflict is happening, even if it's not connected. In some cases, it is but conflict with Russia has been ongoing long before the Ukraine. War. And it just would be interesting to get your perspective on the areas in which, all along that continuum, the United States is doing well, and it's to be better, and how you see our abilities. Yeah, I just want to clarify, because I'm sure people are going, panic, World War Three. you know, I want to say that, you can't be getting, and you know that President Biden and everybody else is saying, we don't want World War Three with Russia, in other words, a direct military conflict between, you know, the United States and Russia, but Russia has a direct military conflict with Ukraine, I think, in Europe, and that's, you know, kind of World War One was in Europe, it was, you know, Germany attacking uh, neighbours in World War One. Uh, World War Two was in Europe, it was also Germany attacking um, its neighbours, uh, in, uh, in World War II. Um, uh, the Soviet Union, um, as it then was, was in, was in the mix in World War II with Stalin attacking neighbors, and in fact attacking countries like the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, and also Finland, that had broken away from uh, the uh, Russian Empire at the end of World War I, and also Poland uh, in that uh, time frame as well. The Germans and uh, you know the, the Soviets kind of moving in as pincers, you know, in, uh, in both directions here. And World War I, Russia was obviously involved, it was the collapse of the empire, and Putin actually talks about what we are now is in terms of a hundred years war. I mean, you never know when a hundred years war gets to a some point along it, because none of us are you know, really around for that um, whole time. But he's saying that Ukraine shouldn't exist because it was a, a basically an artificial creation out of World War I, when um, Ukraine was created as a Soviet Republic inside the Soviet Union after the collapse of the Russian Empire, Ukraine isn't a legitimate state, and you know he's basically um, going to take back Russian territory. Ukraine doesn't exist. That means also again, Russia doesn't exist. Belarus, that's already kind of being obliterated. The paper talks about it. But other former uh, parts of the Russian Empire and the Soviet states are on the same page here. Now, what's the US role in all of this? Now, you know there is a very strong case to be made that we shouldn't be building out the Republic again. You know, after 1918, when the Cavalry Mitchell went into Paris. You know, down uh, through the Arc of Triomphe to help you know liberate uh, France after uh, World War uh, One. That's of course where the Marine Corps was actually born, is out of you know World War One and in the battles um, around uh, France. Uh, World War One definitely put the United States on on the world stage, and then we found ourselves having to you know bail Europe out again. But partly that's because we stepped back from commitments that we made at the end of World War One to be League of Nations. 
And then you realise that actually that was a mistake, and that we had to be much more heavily involved in the creation of the United Nations. But over um, you know the last period of time, in the late uh, the 70 years since uh, World War II, and the creation of the UN system, we've kind of forgotten the importance of that leadership role. We have to to get others, you know, to really step into it uh, and then step up to it. And you know, the point that we're at now, which is you know the point I was trying to make last night over dinner, is really determinative for us as to whether we remain, um, we don't have to be the indispensable power, we do need our allies and partners around the world to step up, we absolutely do, we've been telling them that for a long time. But whether we remain a major power with a leadership role on the world stage, and that will always affect all of our bottom lines. You know, why do people come from all the way around the world to Charlotte and to other US cities? It's because we are international hubs for business. You know, there'll be kind of questions whether the US, you know, kind of lack of leadership or the diminution of our stature will um, have an impact, you know, on our ability to, you know, push forward and grow our economy. You know, we're already seeing, you know, fewer people wanting to come to the United States to study, you know, to work uh, than before because, you know, partly that's, of course, that we need to get a grip on, you know, what's happening with immigration. But there's also been, the United States has not just been the city on the hill or the leadership, but a place that people see for opportunity even if they don't stay there. And all of the trade and you know, the ties will get affected by that as well. Because people are looking to see whether the United States can keep commitments, you know, that it's made, or whether it really has the appetite still to be a major power in terms of setting an example you know, to us in the world. So um, I think we've probably got five minutes or so before we open it up, and you mentioned Putin, and we obviously touched on the a little bit. I guess I saw yesterday, or the reporting from today, that Putin held his annual sort of state, annual speech, in which he invites journalists, and this time the general population was able to tune in, and he was very optimistic about his prospects in Ukraine, Russian prospects in Ukraine, and it seemed as if he was advocating for a consolidated weight sort of strategy. Just waited out in, in American and European resolve to support Ukraine will eventually fade. What is your perspective on where we are with Ukraine now and how likely that strategy is or how effective that strategy is? Well, there's a couple of things to bear in mind. First of all, Putin hasn't had this uh, press conference um, over the last two years on a regular way because he had nothing good to say because they made such a huge strategic blunder um, in invading Ukraine and he didn't want to I mean, put himself up for three questions because, you know, inevitably, um, you know, this would reflect uh, quite badly. So the fact that he is holding this press conference also shows that he's pretty confident that things are turning in his direction. And in fact, if you just look at the headlines of things that he said, it makes it very clear. He said that he has, his goals in Ukraine have not changed, and that um, only when he achieves the goals well, will he be ready to call for peace. And he thinks that, you know, what will happen is, uh, because he's, he's reading not just the TV, he's reading all the headlines and, you know, all the statements that are coming out of uh, Congress, and also European capitals, to be frank. It's not just the US that's having this debate. It's uh, the U European Union and elsewhere. Hungary, um, Viktor Orban is holding up money from the EU, if you could at this point. Uh, Slovakia, you know, for example, has changed the government and are pulling back. There's big debates in Germany you know, about uh, restrictions on them uh, giving funding. And so Putin's looking at this and saying, yeah, I told my guys that the Western resolve wouldn't be there. Now, we were there, a lot more than anticipated initially, but he knows that Ukraine you know, can't uh, continue to fight off Russia at this point. He said it like, openly in the press conference, you know, without at this point support. Because Ukraine hasn't been able to build up its war economy and its military production, it's going to take some years to do that, of course. Just like Russia has lost a huge number of people, so has Ukraine, and Ukraine has a much smaller you know, population. You know, I mean, the, the, um, you know, the casualties are staggering on both sides here, um, including in Russia. You've also got 1.5 million Russians who have left. I mean, this is not a popular war in Russia, by the way, just to be clear. This is very much Vladimir Putin and the cohort around him's war, and many people have left because they don't want to be part of it. But it's also interesting in polls is that um, Russians want the war to end, Putin can see that, but they want it to end on their terms. In other words, no giving back any territory Russia's taken, and no paying for fixing Ukraine. And so, you know, that's also a question for us at this point. If we decide we're not going to pay for Ukraine, you know, is Ukraine going to be then left as a, as a failed state? And I don't mean we, the United States, because the whole expectation would be that Europeans, you know, would step in there as well. But Putin is definitely not going to pay, you know, one ruble 
you know, a kind of one code, you know, towards the um, a reconstruction of Ukraine. And he's going to make sure that, you know, Ukraine does indeed become a third state, that Zelensky will get toppled. And the memory of Churchill uh, was pushed out of uh, the UK after being, the, you know, the victor, or one of the victors in World War II. You know, Zelensky also, in theory, has to um, face an election at some point. It's supposed to be next year. They've put that off. Putin's going to get himself re-elected next year with no problems, you know, whatsoever. No one's criticising Vladimir Putin. But everybody else has elections that he thinks are going to be determinative. And just even the idea of political change in the United States, in France, if Marine Le Pen comes in, or any of the other countries, is enough for Putin to play with to think that he can win psychologically. So it's a mind game, not just a political and military game at this moment. And I think, you know, for any of you, you know, who have had to you know, face off in the playground or just in your own lives in business, you know, the, the psychological aspect of this. This is this is Putin um, grew up in a rough area in um, in Russia. He grew up in, you know, the kind of a, a rough neighborhood, uh, the old uh, courtyard of a, of a kind of communal uh, you know, public housing kind of equivalent. And he just plays the same kind of games as he played there, staring people down, intimidating people, and just figuring that they'll they'll give it up. And that's what he assumes about us, that we're the you know the refined kids from the neighbourhood who you know can't uh, stick things out and that will be gone if he just you know intimidates us enough. So that's the decision. And is that what America's about? I mean, we used to be the country that stood up to bullies. We were the countries that you know didn't let our friends down. And although um, Ukraine isn't a treaty ally, it's definitely a friend. And, you know, the Europeans as well, again, they need to step up. I mean, basically, I'm going to be crude to you. Everyone needs to grow a pair of balls. Sorry, don't make that, you know, kind of like that. And that's kind of how Putin talks. He's a very crude guy. And his idea right now is that we are just going to fade away because we don't have the staying power in every term. And if we step away right now and say we defeated the United States, because he's saying it's a proxy war against the United States for Russia, just look at the things he says and take them seriously. And we defeated NATO, because although NATO isn't in the fight for Ukraine, it isn't World War Three with NATO going after Russia, NATO member countries are. And um, Ukraine's been getting equipment that is NATO standard, and they're still lost. Now, you know, we will know that it's more complicated than that, but that's not how Putin will portray it. And our other treaty allies uh, that we do have, inside of NATO, but also Japan, South Korea, promises we've made to Taiwan, countries like Vietnam, the Philippines, etc. they're going to be really worried. They're going to say, well, um, oops, I've got my, got my Can you switch? Yeah, yeah. okay. I don't think that was part of me, Putin. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, right? I don't know. Uh, they're, they're going to basically say, so, you know, what's happened to the United States? And they're going to start making their own assumptions and their own decisions about how they should uh, defend themselves. We're hearing a lot of countries now talking about, should we get a nuclear weapon? Because is the United States going to be there? And it seems with Ukraine, you give up your nuclear weapons. Remember, Ukraine did have nuclear weapons that they inherited in the 1990s. You give them up, and what happens? You get clobbered. And the United States and the UK told Ukraine we'd be there. Uh, not that we just hold their coat and let them get in a fight. We said we'd actually be there to help them. I mean, I'm up in the playground, oh, I'll hold your coat when I want you in a fight. That's kind of, I'm going to walk off with your coat. Yeah. And that's kind of basically what we're doing right now. And Putin, you know, because he does think in these playground terms, no exaggeration, talks about this all the time. He's going to say, well, they've just gone. So Ukraine is easy pickings. And everybody else is thinking, well, we're going to have to take care of ourselves. Uh, it, it struck me as you were speaking. It is, yeah. yeah. So it struck me as you were talking about the, the difficulty in negotiating the end of this conflict in, in Ukraine, and frankly, thinking about potential other conflicts or other ongoing ones. Um, it, re it reminds me of, of something a teacher very early in my graduate school career said, an international affairs teacher, that um, it's really, really, really hard to fight wars. It's even harder to end them. And I think that's what we're coming to right now. So with that uh, incredible commentary from, from Fiona, I want to open it up to the audience, to questions, and I think I have to uh, give you this. Yeah, let me yeah. one. And I'll, I'll just talk very quickly. Um, so yes, please, right here, and then John. Let's introduce yourself. Yes, please, intro please introduce yourself uh, before you question. Hi, I was named checked by Fiona Hill, which I'm really cool. That is so cool. Anyway, Mary C. Curtis, journalist, and um, in my roll call column uh, today, actually, I talked about 
taking our leaders at their word, you know, as my aunt was said, when people show you who they are, you know, believe them the first time. Um, and we've seen on the world stage the move, and you referenced it to the right. You know, you have builders in the Netherlands, Italy, Hungary, all of these places, based on immigration, but other issues as well. And now we have someone running for office, Trump, who is saying, I will be a dictator on day one, as people are talking about going after uh, the media, civilly and criminally, uh, going after enemies, even folks that served in his administration, which you did, uh, you know, like Millie and generals and others. And I would want to ask your uh, frank opinion. Um, do you see, uh, and still very competitive, is this because folks don't take him seriously in this country? Because there is a sense that we do want perhaps a strong man, an authoritarian, to come in and say, okay, it's going to be this way. What do you think about the future of democracy? And are you taking it seriously? And should other Americans? Well, I'm definitely taking it seriously. No, no joke. I mean, I'll be on the list. I've already been threatened. You know, many times, and you know, there are a couple of people who are surrogates, uh, even just for helping you today to see it. You know, I mean, I, um, I'm not on X and Twitter because it's a sort of cesspool of, you know, all kinds of, you know, terrible commentary, but, you know, I've got plenty of relatives and friends who check it for me and tell me things that people are saying about me. Uh, President Trump even had a statement about me, you know, back in um, October of 2021. So, yeah, I, I take that very seriously, as others do. Paul Ryan um, was just on a podcast quite recently and made similar comments. You know, perhaps it would have been good for him to say some of these things earlier. Um, I certainly think so. But people are taking this extremely seriously, uh, the statements that uh, President Trump makes. Uh, and, you know, what is the reason, you know, behind all of this? I think you did put your um, finger on it. The, the world is so complicated at the moment, it's so complex, it's so difficult to solve all of these issues. It takes all of us actually making sacrifices and also stepping up. And sometimes it's very hard to figure out how to do that. Somebody actually asked me, Raj, you know, last night about, uh, I was going to ask, about whether I, um, I have hope. I do have hope, by the way, because we have institutions that still work. Uh, we have you know, people like everyone gathered here who are active in the private sector and civil society and journalism. All of us have a voice. All of us have a way of making an impact. All of us have a way of speaking out. And doing things you know in our own way here. and this is the moment to do that it's not just it's the moment to actually you know do something on ukraine but it's also a kind of a moment to do something here um domestically and to kind of you know dig deep and ask ourselves about the kind of america that we want to live in you know last night at uh, dinner um uh, where everyone was asked to put their hands up if they were from charlotte originally there weren't so many hands i mean this america is built on the back of, of immigration migration you know, we can go back multiple generations and find obviously the people in Moscow from somewhere, unless you're Native Americans, you know, kind of every old family has come from somewhere at some point along the line. That's the greatness of America is in its diversity uh, and um, in, you know, the fact that people come from all over. Uh, but, you know, at this particular moment in time, we've been battered by crises. And if we look back in history, it's when you're battered by a whole combination of crises that these kinds of moments are that really test us and where you know leadership really matters, where negative leaders can really emerge. You know, we think back to the same period a hundred years ago. I said Putin was talking about hundred years war. You know, we had a period of where we faced demagogy across the world, and in fact, it emerged in Germany and many other parts of Europe in the same period. In fact, World War One, huge economic crisis uh, with the Wall Street crash and a pandemic. I mean, we've got all of that now, haven't we? We've got multiple wars, ongoing wars. We've got, we've got in the, you know, the end of a pandemic, and who knows when the next one's going to come along. I already mentioned the demographic and the technological climate change you know, as well. And we had a, a major economic crisis in 2008, 2009, where many of the people in this room from younger generations are experiencing the after effects of that. And that makes people extraordinarily unhappy. And you saw, you know, in Germany in the 1920s and the 1930s, in the UK, you know, in other places, in Europe with the rise of uh, also right-wing and left-wing populist movements. You know, it was on all sides of this, you know, the Bolsheviks in, uh, in Russia, you know, for example, the Spartacus, uh, and also in Germany and elsewhere, the rise of the Communist Party here in the United States and, and other places as well. Everyone was looking for a solution, either through ideology 
or sometimes in the case of a strong man, usually, you know, kind of a strong man, although there are strong women out there, Maloney um, in Italy and Marine Le Pen, you know, trying to present herself. And so I think, you know, that that's kind of part of the issue as you put the finger on it. People are looking for somebody to help get us out of this situation. You know, but sadly, it's on us. You know, it's on how we, you know, uh, basically organize ourselves and our institutions. One person is not going to fix anything as much as we would like that to be the case. So, so, John, I know I promised that you would be next, but I lied. So, I, I, I promise you will be next after. But we have students who are here who will have to leave relatively soon, and we'd love to get their questions. So, uh, Mallory Creek High School. Sorry, sorry, John. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Jermaine Bain from Federal State of Agua de Mallory Creek High School. Um, I just first wanted to thank you for coming out, giving us some of your confidence, giving us some of your grace. It was really inspiring to see you actively talk about issues that some people might consider a little bit more problematic. I wanted to take a step back from the minor discussion of Russia and Ukraine and kind of go for a wider perspective. Um, in my generation, it is a huge debate between acceptance and tolerance. And I wanted to kind of understand from your perspective, since you have traveled all around the world, what has been the consensus of acceptance or tolerance? What have people really been striving for? And if it is acceptance or tolerance, how can we ensure that people fall in line with the ideas of that? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jimmy. That's a really important question because, you know, getting back to Mary's question, it's at times of crisis that people become, in many cases, the most intolerant uh, and lack of acceptance because they're looking for reasons for why things happen and they always look around to blame someone. And we see that throughout history that in terms of um, when, you know, people are saying, well, I'm not getting what I want, but, you know, this group seems to be getting what they want or, you know, they seem to be getting undue pro uh, prominence you know, in society and you know, I'm somehow losing my position, then you know, there's obviously something wrong with this. I mean, everything that we've seen uh, over the last uh, couple of decades that your uh, generation has really been profited by uh, illustrates this more than anything else. Um, how old are you, Jimmy? 16. 16, the same age as my daughter. And so, I mean, my daughter talks to me about this all the time, that you know, she kind of feels that you know, her generation, Generation Z, your generation, um, is really getting the short end of the stick, you know, as we would put it. The most diverse generation in American history, and perhaps the most beleaguered and beset generation. Because, you know, the, the, the generation ahead of you, millennials, I mean, I'm Generation X, I'm sorry about that. You know, <laughs> we, we haven't really, you know, been very good stewards of the country, the climate, you know, kind of anything. You know, we're creating technologies that make life, you know, supposedly easier, but actually make life more difficult, divide us all off. You know, kind of against each other. I mean, again, why I'm not on um, social media because I just see the divisions that it, uh, that it fosters. It doesn't encourage people, you know, to come together, you know, in a way that they would get more acceptance and tolerance and understanding other people's uh, viewpoints. I think you know what we need to do. Um, get off your screens, everybody. You know, if you can't get out there and meet people, it's one of the reasons. You know, I've been coming here, and I'm really thrilled that you know your high school and others are taking part in things like world affairs councils. You need to mentor up. You need to tell you know older people here from all these different cohorts about what's important to you. You need to have peer-to-peer -peer, you know engagement. And we and the you know the older you know side of things, you know we really do need your help and assistance moving across generations, moving across racial barriers, gender. You know every issue that's on the table is dividing us, and we need to find ways of pulling together. And we need to listen you know, to you as well. And so I would just encourage um, you at the high school you know, and others to play long roles, not just in things like modern UN or in youth movements, but also to engage in further generations because, you know, you might talk to your parents or your grandparents or neighbors, but we need to have active uh, collaboration and cooperation so that we can understand. People only really accept and become more tolerant when they have direct experience and personal relationships with people. And we need to, you know, use that uh, time and time again, not be, um, uh, you know, basically falling into the temptation to be divided. And again, social media can be helpful at a kind of a neighborhood level. I mean, I do, you know, use it for you know, checking on my neighbors and things. But on the larger level, it can never substitute for just basic human interaction and for looking about what brings us all together. But thank you, Jermaine. Thank you. We have one more in Mallory Creek High School, but I think 
at the back that I noticed and then, and then the <laughs> okay, hi, my name is Ray Sheffield. I'm a best student at Miles Creek High School, and I just really want to know what is it truly like meeting Putin? Because it seems that like a lot of politicians pull away from the idea of mixing personal perspective with their work as it's unpersonal. Unprofessional, but Putin has stayed in the Soviet Union ideology for years now that oh, Ukraine is an extension of Russia and NATO and the US are anti Russian alliances. So I just want to know how that truly differentiates from meeting other politics. Well, thank you very much. That's a really great question. Putin is always very personal. And if I made my you know, somewhat crude references, the kind of thing that Putin does all the time. Because Putin's always, as I mentioned before, trying to intimidate people. And he says that his greatest skill is working with people, which doesn't mean like human resources, you know, trying to figure each out your best potential. He's looking at you know, your weaknesses and trying to figure out how we can turn them you know, against, uh, against everybody. He doesn't want tolerance and acceptance. He wants the exact opposite. And you might have noticed that just recently, Putin um, has said he wants to criminalize the international LGBTQ organization. There's no such thing. Putin is looking out for the most marginalized groups he can to target them. And he will target anybody of any kind of background if he thinks that it will help pit people against each other. He always makes things personal. He, however, takes incredible offense if somebody personally disrespects him. So, you know, this is a man also with, you know, some issues of his own. Uh, what he said about what's it like to um, meet with him, he's very cold, um, as you can probably imagine. I have actually sat next to him at dinner multiple times. He never eats or drinks, which makes you feel nervous. Because you know, once you just put your tea, or, you know, kind of what's wrong with the food. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm sure you're pretty comfortable sitting with the people at your table, but he doesn't make you feel comfortable there because his whole goal is to make you feel uncomfortable. And really, you know, the situation that we're in now, Putin's quite unusual among um, world leaders. He's from the security services, the old KGB. You know, we don't have any other world leaders like that. Uh, the first President Bush had been the director of the CIA, but it's not the same because, you know, he had also, you know, been in all kinds of other political roles. He was appointed to that. Putin's the first person um, who was a kind of a black arts operative, you know, who's kind of basically taken over you know, kind of a, a country. And he doesn't play by the rules, he makes the rules. He's somebody who's always trying to undermine others. And, um, you know, unfortunately, he's shown that that works. And that, that's kind of what we're dealing with. We're dealing with somebody who doesn't think like everybody else, who's thinking about how he can turn everything to negative advantage uh, for the United States. You know, and I think that we need, I mean, getting back to, you know, some of the other way we frame things about how we all play a role. What we really need in the United States is to bring in all kinds of different perspectives. So when we have people who've grown up in Russia who understand you know, how people like Putin operate, uh, there's a podcast that uh, Yulia Yoffe um, uh, had done recently about Putin and about how he grew up in the courtyards and the kind of way that he uh, thinks. We need to tap into that. We need you, know, you and you know, your other colleagues from high school to think about also you know, running for public office or you know, getting involved in foreign policy because we need everybody in this to kind of you know, think about how to deal with difficult people. I mean, the one strength, I mean, the really key strength of the United States, like I said before, is its diversity. And, you know, it's, uh, it's human talent and it's human capital. Putin's throwing all of his away. And so I think we don't, you know, have to give him, you know, this opportunity. Uh, and we have to recognize what a difficult person, you know, he is to deal with. And we have to pull ourselves together, you know, to push back. It doesn't mean that all Russians are like this at all. Leadership really matters, but this is pretty negative leadership on the part of uh, Vladimir Putin. Well, thank you so much uh, for your question. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for those questions. They were outstanding. Um, I am, I am going to go to John uh, belatedly, but, but also um, uh, looking forward to your question. Uh, Vladimir Putin is clearly uh, excited about the differences of opinion in the United States about U.S. support for Ukraine. Uh, and he'll have the whole 
entire next year to watch that take place. Uh, I'm concerned about what's happening inside Ukraine at the same time because I believe Zelensky is up for election sometime soon. Does he face the kind of opposition that encourages Ukraine to settle and get out of the war? And they're going to be running out of people in some ways and fashion. And that troubles me as much as our own election. Do you have a comment on that? No, thank you very much, John. Look, I mean, that's one of the reasons on the last point about running out of people, why the Ukrainians have been asking for more military equipment. Uh, because, you know, what the Russians have been doing when they were short of military equipment, um, what the Russian military has been doing is, you know, basically going around the prisons. There's a very large prison population, which has declined by tens of thousands, uh, pushing people like cannon fodder, or taking, you know, peripheral marginal areas of Russian <coughs> poorest areas, the Russian rust belts, throwing them at the front, you know, spreading a lot of money around in those areas so that people are even willing to give up, you know, their uh, family members to go to the front as cannon fodder. I mean, it, it's been, you know, just a, a, a really... In a heinous approach uh, to uh, military here. And when the, the Ukrainians tell us that you know they would be well served by more military equipment, they need it because you know they're sacrificing you know the, the, the best and the brightest. Actually, the Russians like to make propaganda out of this as well. The Russian when I say the Russians, by the way, I'm not talking about the Russian people all the time. I just I'm talking about you know as a kind of a, uh, a fill-in for you know the, the Kremlin and the you know the cohorts you know around them here, although you know there is quite a bit of support on the kind of Russian equivalent to the hard right for this war. But they're also going around telling everybody that you know, the Ukrainians are hemorrhaging people. Putin says this all the time, they're fighting for the last Ukrainian. But Russia's got a demographic problem as well. It may be the larger country, 140 million, uh, and to Ukraine's uh, 40 million. But Russia has lost more men uh, in uh, this war than it, uh, the Soviet Union did in Afghanistan, or, or the, the Russians lost in Chechnya as well, an internal you know, conflict was pretty brutal in the 1990s. It's about 150,000 uh, of casualties, you know, at large, it's always kind of, uh, you know, in, uh, in terms of like injured, but probably 150,000 dead. So we've got about 300,000. You know, Ukraine's losses are pretty high, you know, as well, not quite at that scale. But, you know, Putin's view is that like, I can keep this going. And he's just talked about we've got 500,000 more volunteers. Well, you know, they haven't got an infinite population. And a lot of the Russian population is elderly or babies. You know, so it's not like you've got, you know, 140 million people you can throw up front. And it's got an aging population, an inverse, you know, pyramid like many other, you know, countries do. 1.5 million people have left and are in other places. You know, so this is, this is going to have an impact over the longer time. So it's not just... You know, kind of Ukraine, but you're right. Inside of Ukraine right now, there is a lot of recrimination going on. You know, expectations are raised over the counteroffensive. You know, there's a huge piece yesterday in the Washington Post. You know, doing a blow by blow about you know what happened and what went wrong. Uh, you can see um, tensions uh, among the leadership in Ukraine. You know, if Zelensky um, sued for peace at this point and capitulated to Russia, you can be sure he'd be out. You know, the next day. They'd, they'd agree to put the election off um, until you know they've uh, found themselves in something of a better place. I mentioned before, Winston Churchill was elected out of office, you know, after uh, World War II because he wasn't seen as the man for the next moment. You know, uh, Zelensky's really risen to the occasion, you know, in these uh, last uh, two years, and so have other Ukrainians. But inevitably, politics comes back, and people are sniping at each other because things are not going the way uh, that they expected or wanted. And Putin's going to play right into that. Because Putin does have long tentacles, you know, into Ukraine. He thought Ukraine wouldn't fight back because he thought he bought everyone off in terms of Ukrainian oligarchs, business people, and politicians. He's got his own Ukrainians, you know, kind of sitting around in Moscow ready to parachute in, you know, to be president, including people he's quite close to. So this is a very dangerous moment for Ukraine as well. And a lot of this, um, this recrimination, is based on the fact that we are talking Ukrainians down at the moment. And we were saying, you know, they lost J.D. Vance, you know, just you know, the other day. I need to get this over with Ron Johnson, uh, who, Senator Johnson, who was the head of the Ukraine caucus, and a couple of years ago was, you know, very vocal in support of uh, Ukraine. All the people who have been champions of Ukraine switching around because nobody wants to be seen to be a loser. Well, do we really want Vladimir Putin to be a winner, you know, in that context? That's, you know, kind of what this is uh, really about at this moment. And just, you know, in our own domestic politics, I mean, I always try not to be partisan, I'm not a member of a party, never been in a campaign, but it's hard at this particular moment to see, you know, kind of, you know, the, the difference between, you know, trying to tear down Biden 
uh, not give him a win because of our own presidential election and handing Vladimir Putin you know, a win here over this issue of funding for Ukraine because Putin wants Biden to lose too. And uh, Putin would be ecstatic at the idea of Trump coming back because he thinks that Trump will hand over Ukraine. And there's a, you know, a direct line, sadly, from that first impeachment trial that I um, played a part in all the way through um, to now, because Putin thought we were not serious about Ukraine. And Ukraine has become part of our domestic politics, and that's fatal for Ukraine and very, very beneficial for Vladimir Putin, because you know, uh, he knows exactly how to push our buttons. And you know, he, he, he has a moment of forethought here. He's not you know, kind of our friend. And you know, neither of frankly is Viktor Orban, who's running around everywhere too. The Hungarians have, uh, rather, Orban has claims against Ukraine's territory. There are Hungarian speakers there who are not being addressed. It's true that they're probably not getting a lot of investment in Hungarian language education, but there's a lot of other people playing out their own politics here and coming around and trying to mess about in our elections and, uh, you know, and, uh, and our politics because they've got their own issues you know, at stake. And you see in Germany and in France and in other countries as well, people politicizing Ukraine for the same sorts of reasons. And we're basically, Putin is ecstatic at this moment. I mean, just go back and read some of the comments and the commentary from Putin from his press conference. And again, he's had this press conference because he thinks he's winning. Thank you. One more. One more. One more. Yeah, so we've got one more, um, <coughs> sir, at the back of the room, back with the, your hand up. No. Yes. Well, is that him? No. Yes, yes, yes. One, one yes, table yes. further back. His, his hand was slightly high. I oh, apologize. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Long and arms. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that was a really fascinating talk, and I really appreciate the focus. But the focus was largely on almost traditional geostrategic issues. You brought in new insights. Um, I'm sobered by the observation, I think, by the uh, president-elect of Guatemala that in the last century, uh, coups were quick, they were done by armies and seizure of the radio station, but now in the 21st century, coups and takeovers by authoritarians are extended matters using pseudo-law and stacked judiciary. Um, now, clearly, the United States knew how to intervene, for better or worse, in places like Iran in 1953, in Chile, and around the world when we had old-fashioned coups. What can the United States do, hopefully, to present a, a more sophisticated and positive position in the 21st century when, well, dare, dare I say, we ourselves are faced what's arguably a continuing coup uh, perhaps decisively decided by two Supreme Court uh, uh, decisions that, that right. they decided they would consider tomorrow. Right. When we're faced with Orban, um, Poland, did we intervene in Poland to help uh, Tusk get elected? Great. So thank you for your question. That's a great question. We're just right up against time, so uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Helm. No, we did not intervene in Poland to get Tusk elected. I just want to kind of make that very clear that I know there are always conspiracy theories out there, uh, including on social media, and we did not do that. Just like we didn't start off the Arab Spring, the color revolutions in Ukraine or Georgia or any of these other places either. Vladimir Putin thinks we did, and there's plenty of other people here who would like to do that. And that's another part of your you know, question about unconventional means. I mean, what's replaced the, the telegraph and you know the radio station in the past is is Twitter, X, you know, another social media, TikTok, Instagram, you know, and people can you know, perpetuate a coup using social media as well as stack judiciary. So I think you answered the question, you know, that you proposed. The United States could do a lot by actually showing that we're serious about you know stunning coups ourselves. You know, uh, Trump did uh, try uh, to uh, perpetrate a coup on January 6th. And it also started when he tried to extort uh, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, to open up investigations in Ukraine against uh, Joe Biden and Hunter Biden, you know, as part of uh, the start of his campaign. I mean, I, when I was in the government as a non-partisan official, had wanted to leave before the campaign started, so I wouldn't be part of it. And then I left one week before the infamous phone call, which I actually recommended against, not because I thought that would happen, you know, the extortion, but because I didn't think it would be you know, particularly productive, and it turns out to be you know, quite bad, even worse than I even you know, anticipated. So if we get our own act together, people are watching. 
people are watching very closely. And I will just be very frank that a lot of the rest of the world thinks we're a banana republic. And in fact, when I pushed back um, against interference in our election in 2016, with the Russian ambassador, he said to me, Miss Hill, are you saying that the United States is a banana republic, that you're so fragile and vulnerable that we could influence your elections? And that is just, you know, to be very frank, the view uh, or outside. Everyone is watching in horror. I'm not, uh, some people in Glee, some people with their fingers crossed that actually United States will go down that path because it will make the world you know, a lot easier for the Maduros and uh, the uh, Orbans and you know, all the others of them in this world. But you know, our friends and allies and partners and others you know, always wish the United States well or investors in our country are looking on with uh, something of shock and just kind of wondering what the United States is going to look like afterwards. And there'll be a lot less you know, decisions to invest here in Charlotte and in North Carolina and most of our other states if people think that the United States has become a banana republic at the federal level. That's just the bottom line. So everyone is watching this, and I think you, know, you laid it out very clearly there, so thank you. Well, well thank you. This has been an incredible session. Community and all of you for being here, and, and thanks once again. Yeah, oh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.